Here is the patch of grass where Roger Federer has made so much history. And it started right there. Wimbledon is the world's oldest tournament and the most prestigious of the four Grand Slams, the one that every player wants to win. The club's honor board is full of illustrious names, and in 1998, another emerged. Roger Federer. When he won the Junior Wimbledon title at 17 years old, he never imagined the success that would follow. It is truly amazing what I'm able to live, actually. This, this life I'm living is, is quite extraordinary, so I'm, I'm very thankful for that, and uh, I hope it doesn't end here. Play speaks for itself, but to me, the most important thing that he's been able to do it for so long is his passion for the game. Well, I was hoping that uh, something magical would happen at some stage, not this magnitude. I don't think you can think this far, and if you told the people that I'm coming to play Wimbledon for the next 20 years, I'm going to win eight, they're going to go like, yeah, we're right, whatever, you know, like little Swiss kid, like he's lost his mind, you know. Number one fan, along with millions of other people, and I just loved the way his, he played, the creativity he had, the, the quietness on the court, you know, he, his footwork was so sublime. In 2003, the former ball boy and junior champion of 1998 won his first Grand Slam title at the British Stadium with a masterclass victory over giant Australian Mark Philipposis. And the rest is history. Well, what he's achieved in the sport is incredible. He has inspired so many tennis players around the world. His journey to the top of the men's game is the one of a true champion in every sense of the word. It's a huge, huge bonus still to be playing tennis at this level. My God, it's uh, totally unexpected. The 15th of September, 2022, was a sad day for sports. Roger Federer announced his retirement at 41 years old, marking the end of one of the greatest ever sporting careers. Been a, it's been also a tough decision, but at the same time also one that I could see coming for a number of years now. I'm old enough uh, as it is and uh, you know you come to crossroads in life sometimes and for me I knew I was uh, on thin ice for uh, a while and uh, you hope it gets better and it really didn't and then at one point uh, I just said okay, it's, it's good, we've done well. Um, uh, last few years have been hard enough and uh, I've enjoyed myself thoroughly and uh, it's it's the moment to do it so uh, and, and that was it. He's someone that I watched as a kid growing up and was fortunate to get the opportunity to, to play against. Probably the most popular guy um, on the tour I mean he has inspired so many tennis players around the world both male and female and as Andy said you know uh, this weekend probably is all about he, the celebration of, uh, of his career. We miss him but I'm sure we'll see him around. He's doing the best for his body, but obviously the fans will miss him. His behavior inside and outside the court, it's amazing, and the movements and the technique, and for me, it's like the best ever. Corn of the sport, and um, if I could sum him up, I would say he's a class act on and off the court. He's won so many times, um, but he's a great person, great personality. At 36 years old, Federer broke an all-time record and shook the tennis world when he became the first man to win an astonishing 20 Grand Slam titles after winning his sixth Australian Open in 2018 with a five-set victory over Marin Cilic. For those who were born to see Federer in his glory days, it might seem that tennis will never be the same after he retired. The player kept the spirit of the game alive and flourishing all these years, with impeccable speed, undefeated technique, and an exceptional all-around game 
he became one of the most widely known names in the world of tennis. But how did an ordinary ball boy become one of the most loved faces in sports today? It all started on the tennis courts of the city of Basel, Switzerland. Roger Federer was born on August 8, 1981, in Basel, Switzerland. To Swiss father Robert Federer and South African mother Lynette Federer. His mother was of Dutch and French ancestry. His parents exposed him to tennis when he was a toddler, and he played his first tournament at eight years old. In his early years, Federer was just an ordinary boy who liked to have fun on the court during training. But he was talented. In the matches, he was eager and dreamed of becoming the number one in the world. It soon became clear that the boy and the racket were made for each other. At 11, he ended up among the top three junior tennis players all over Switzerland. And as he grew up, so did his ambition. He decided that tennis would become his destiny. At 12 years old, I had to sort of take a decision, soccer or tennis, and it was actually quite easy, to be honest. Um, I was successful in soccer, but it doesn't go at the, at the pace as, as tennis goes. Um, you know, soccer takes much more, many more years, and tennis, I liked the, the fact that I was the one to blame if I lost. In soccer, I was always kind of the, the bad loser, sometimes saying, the goalie was so bad today, I can't believe we lost, you know? And I was just like, that's not fair, you know? I need to blame myself if I lost, and then of course, I chose tennis, I, you know, the more I lost, the more I cried, and I thought the, end, the world was gonna end, um, but uh, I, I do love uh, team competition. At 14 years old, Federer moved out of home. By then, he was training for several hours, participating in different tournaments and getting into fitness. This paid off. He became Switzerland's junior champion and won a chance to train at the National Swiss Tennis Center, something young tennis players can only dream of. At 16, he dropped out of school and decided to risk everything on tennis. In 1998, Federer made his professional debut, but sadly ended up losing his first ever match. However, this did not dampen the young man's spirit. That same year, the 16-year-old from Switzerland became Wimbledon's junior champion, following in the footsteps of Bjorn Borg and Pat Cash, both winners of Junior Wimbledon. For those who knew him best, it became clear that they were witnessing a legend in the making. Federer's love affair with Wimbledon began with that junior title. In 1999, Federer made his Davis Cup debut against Italy, leading Switzerland to its only Davis Cup title. He became the youngest tennis player at 18 years old to end the year among the world's top 100, finishing that season at number 64. Look, I was a very different type of uh, character on the tennis court 10, 15 years ago. Um, I had a, a, quite a transformation from a, uh, a screaming, racket-throwing, swearing kind of brat on the tennis court to this calm guy you know today. It's, it's very strange how I've been able to put the hammer down at one point in my career and just say, that's enough. I can't stand it watching me throwing rackets and embarrass myself in front of thousands of people in, in a live stadium. So I, I, I try to change. Today, when the young guys come up, I have to say I'm so impressed how well they behave. There's hardly any racket throwing going, going on anymore. Nobody is as moody as I used to be. So it's, uh, in a way, I'm very happy I was that way back then. Do you look back now and think, gosh, what was I doing? Um, yes, but at the same time, I'm happy I did that yeah. because I don't have the urge today to act the way I used to. I'm just totally relaxed, missing the easiest of overheads and just turning around and go like, you know what? I just won't miss it next time, it's fine. In 2001, he caused one of the biggest upsets in Wimbledon history. In the fourth round, he defeated four-time defending champion Pete Sambras, ending the Americans' unbeaten run of 31 matches at Wimbledon. Then, tennis quickly went into overdrive for the upcoming tennis star.
without ever imitating the techniques of those who came before him, he managed to take what he could from the champions, like Sampras and Stefan Edberg. The gifted shot maker, known for his forehand, found his own identity. He did it his way, and he did it right. It was long before his major singles win at the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney that Federer first met Mirka Vavrinkova, another tennis player and the woman who would become his girlfriend, wife, and mother of their children. Mirka was born in Czechoslovakia and moved with her family to Switzerland when she was two years old. Her love for tennis began at a young age. At the 2002 Hopman Cup, she paired alongside her future husband. She was far from imagining that one day she would become a key part of his amazing journey. Mirka would quit the sport and retired at the age of 24 due to a persistent foot injury. After her retirement, she became Federer's public relation manager, making the pair's bond even stronger. The couple tied the knot in 2009 in Federer's hometown of Basel, and he declared having found in Mirka the best wife he could have ever imagined. A few months after their wedding, they welcomed identical twin girls, Myla and Charlene. The couple later had another set of twins in 2014, this time twin boys, Leo and Lenny. The man might be a legend, but he is also just an ordinary dad. And despite a hectic schedule, he managed to spare plenty of time for his family. Clearly, family is the um, most important thing in life, you know, as I know. My wife's been incredibly supportive throughout, and uh, she's always uh, the backbone, you know, and uh, it's, it's been great with her. The tennis star attributes his longevity in the sport in part to Mirka's support. The mother of four regularly brought their children to her husband's matches. She has supported Federer throughout their relationship as well as his philanthropic pursuits. Obviously, I've had an amazing uh, support in my wife today and who's, you know, with the kids now, who makes it all work for me to see them almost every single day when I'm on tour, when she travels with the kids with me. And uh, that's very important for me to keep the motivation and inspiration going to go through these difficult times on tour that sometimes are just hard, you know, the logistics and trying to manage everything. It's, it, it's, it's hard, but it's so much fun doing it all together now. I never thought I was going to be playing as a dad, and here I am. The girls are almost three and a half years old. It's really, really, truly amazing, and I hope I can still do it for many more years because I, I, I can't get enough of it. I think sports is a great way of life, a great school, a great uh, uh, way to understand winning and losing, um, team sports, um, you know, just coping with all those things. I think it's great. The couple has also donated more than $1 million toward education in Africa through the Roger Federer Foundation he founded in 2003. Federer has been working hard to make a real difference in the life of underprivileged children all around the world and to help them take control of their future by getting access to education, health, and sports. As a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador, the player has been involved in various philanthropic causes, with a particular interest in South Africa, his mother's home country. In July 2015, Federer launched a new childcare center in impoverished Malawi. The foundation is 10, 11 years old now, so I've uh, always thought the, you know, the children are tomorrow's future and uh, I really enjoy supporting them and giving them an opportunity to be able to go to school. In this case, it will be preschool here in Malawi, and I think it's really important that every child should have this opportunity, so I'm, I'm trying to help as much as I can. The 2003 French Open first round loss for Federer was a pivotal point in his career. At 21 years old, Federer fell in straight sets in the first round to Luis Horna, a Peruvian ranked 88th at the time. 
After losing his confidence, his mental weakness caused him to lose within 45 minutes. The loss left a lasting impact on him, but he would learn from it. And a reversal of fortunes was just around the corner. In 2003, Federer won his first Wimbledon Grand Slam. Federer described his emotions were similar to when he beat Sampras back in 2001. A year later, he reached the final again, displacing Andy Roddick as world number one in tennis in February 2004, holding the position for 237 weeks in a row until 2008. That year, Federer went on to win the Australian Open, Wimbledon again, and his first ever US Open. With consistency, resilience, a technique, and an instantly recognizable image, he set himself apart. Well, he's been uh, a little bit injured in the beginning of the season, but uh, he's not losing it. He's still the number one player in the world. I believe the end of this year, he's still going to be the number one player in the world. Uh, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if he has the motivation and stay away from injuries, he's going to play for another five years in top tennis. You know, he's one of the greats and, uh, you know, never count Roger out. I mean, he's a person who always gives 100%. He wants to win. He's very prof professional in what he's doing. So, you know, com you know coming into Wimbledon for Roger, it's uh, his main ambition, his main goal is to try try to defend that title. I think I've done a good job of staying who I am, you know, there's the same guy as back in the day. I had to adapt to a new situation, being so famous, so recognized, I guess, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's difficult to get used to that, you know, um, recognition and the, the awareness that everybody might know you. But it, and especially in this day and age with social media and everybody having a phone almost uh, with pictures, it, it becomes tricky, you know. But I think I've uh, been able to remain the person I am and I, keep, I stay very grounded. So I don't see that sex symbol kind of guy anyway. And uh, I don't feel that way. I feel like a, a normal guy who, who just happens to be quite successful. It was with the help of Peter Carter that Federer became the player he is today. The Australian coach discovered the child prodigy in Basel. After seeing a huge potential in him, he took him under his wing and became a mentor to the upcoming tennis star. Carter used to rave about him to his friends back home, and one of those was Darren Cahill, who himself was coaching a prodigy of his own called Leighton Hewitt. The two would play each other many times throughout their careers, with Hewitt becoming one of many players out to get Federer. Who knew they would both become Wimbledon champions and world number one? Carter was said to have a powerful calming influence on Federer, who initially struggled to get to grips with life as a touring professional. He can also thank him for that masterful one-handed backhand. However, tragedy struck in 2002 when Carter was killed in a car crash while on his honeymoon with his wife in South Africa. Federer was destroyed. Fast forward to 2019. Federer spoke about the mentor's influence on his life. What do you think he would have thought to see you here now with 20 Grand Slams? It's okay. Sorry. I hope he would be proud. I guess he didn't want me to be a, um, a wasted talent, so... <laughs> I guess it was somewhat of a... Um, a wake-up call for me when he passed away. 
He started to train harder, which drove him to win his first Grand Slam in 2003, 11 months after Peter's death. Today was Roger Federer's first Wimbledon final, his first Grand Slam win. Nobody thinks for a second that it will be his last. He's always been tipped as a future champion, and today he showed why. Roger Federer, Wimbledon champion. You better get used to that. <laughs> Thank you. No, um, it's, it's an absolute uh, dream for me coming true and I was always joking around when I was a boy. <laughs> I'm going to win this. And <laughs> now I have it. You're not going to let them take that away for a while, are you? Carter would sadly not go on to witness the greatness that Federer achieved. In 2005, always in control, he came through and proved that he was still the best on the grass when he went on to win Wimbledon for his third consecutive Wimbledon title. Becoming the only man since the Open era began in 1968 to win three consecutive Wimbledon titles. However, the French Open proved problematic for Federer. The tournament of Roland Garros is the only one of the four Grand Slams ever to be played on clay, the game's slowest surface. Although Federer was the best on grass, it was a different story across the English Channel. He made his debut there in 1999, but it would take him seven years to reach the final. But by now, he had a goal and a target at the French Open final in 2006, he faced defending champion and Spanish sensation 19-year-old Rafael Nadal, who would become his biggest rival. Nadal seemed to be fitter, fresher, and just a better player on clay. On that day, Nadal won three sets to one, and it was Federer's first defeat in a Grand Slam final. Less than a month later, the two came face to face again at the final in Wimbledon. It was Nadal's first appearance there. If Nadal lost, Federer would become the only third male to win the title in four years running. Federer had lost on clay, but on grass, he was the king. The, one of the biggest, I think, um, challenges that uh, a tennis, professional tennis player can face in today's tennis is the transition from clay courts to, to grass courts, from the slowest to the fastest surface. Uh, on clay, there's a lot of sliding, um, high bounce. Uh, it's just completely different surface. Grass, lower bounce, not as fast as it was maybe 20 years ago. It's very hard to, to, to break a serve on, uh, of your opponent on, on the grass court. So it is, it is a very demanding surface and requires a lot of attention, a lot of work. He won his fourth consecutive Wimbledon singles title. The young Spanish star had sparked up the greatest rivalry since Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe. The following year didn't prove to be quite fruitful for Federer. In 2007, Nadal defeated Federer again on the final of the French Open. But the Swiss didn't have long to wait for revenge. Federer showed his class. Wimbledon gave him the chance to equal Bjorn Borg's record by winning the title five years in succession. Throughout the years, this cycle of epic battles, losing and then revenge winning, would go on. <laughs> 2008 was, by Federer's lofty standards, one of his worst years on tour. The world number one lost in the Australian Open semi-final to Novak Djokovic at the start of the year. He then lost in the finals at both Roland Garros and Wimbledon, 
to Rafael Nadal. And then, to add insult to injury, Nadal took over as the world number one, ending Federer's record run of 237 consecutive weeks atop the rankings. Federer's dream of a record six successive Wimbledon titles was dashed, but he would learn from his loss. I guess you do have incredible confidence in yourself sometimes, but then also big doubts. Whereas if you see another player, all you see is his strengths and weaknesses as a, you know, more just like on the surface. So you don't know truly how confident or how worried he is about his own game. So sometimes it's a bit of a, you know, a chess game or I don't want to say you pretend like you're super fit or you're super, yeah. uh, you know, tired. You know, you try to maybe sort of fake the guy out a little bit, you know, because what the other guy sees might affect the way he plays. At the 2008 U.S. Open, Federer won his fifth consecutive U.S. Open against Andy Murray and 13th Grand Slam. Not only did Federer equal Sampras' achievement, but he would soon overtake him. These tennis fans have just seen Roger Federer prove yet again that on his day he's too much for anyone. Nonetheless, Andy Murray has learnt a lot here at Flushing Meadows. At times he played brilliant tennis, tennis of a calibre that suggests he'll be contesting more Grand Slam finals. Yes, I would like to think of this slam, you know, being, you know, the slam I got five in a row, really. I mean, I know the 13 is a strange number, funny number, whatever you want to think about of it. I don't, want, I don't want to get stuck at 13. Uh, that's the last thing I want to do. But I'd love to, you know, break Sampras' record. But at the moment, I, I think the joy is right there, just having won a Grand Slam for the first time this year again and having, you know, kept the run alive here at the Open. I'm not number one in the world anymore, you know, but this is definitely the best reaction I could do is like, you know, win again here in New York and, you know, just make uh, things more easy again for me, you know, especially in the press room, you know, uh, it was tough sometimes, you know, just answering kind of stupid questions sometimes, you know, but uh, now it's more easy again and I think for the rest of the, the year things are going to be more relaxed. His attempt at number 14 came at the French Open in June 2009. The elusive French Open, the only Grand Slam he had left to win, had proved to be his nemesis. This time, when he reached the final for the fourth consecutive year, having lost the previous three to Nadal, Federer faced Nadal's conqueror, Sweden's Robin Soderling. The defending champion had been knocked out in the fourth round. Nadal's absence inspired and boosted Federer's confidence. Exactly 10 years after his debut at the tournament, Federer finally made it. He became the only third man in the Open era to win all four majors. This was one of the most emotional wins of his career, as he was tied with Pete Sampras's record for 14 Grand Slam wins. I've come a long way, and uh, to get it at the to get it at the end, it's um, as the last remaining Grand Slam. It's a, it's an incredible feeling, and um, I'm of course very proud at this at this very moment. And the prices just kept on coming. Less than a month later, at Wimbledon Center Court, Federer clinched that historic 15th Grand Slam. It now Rogers King again. You know they were writing him off too soon, which is what usually happens with the great champions. And he's one of the greatest of all time. It's just uh, really hard to compare people of different generations. How do you compare Suzanne Longland to a Margaret Court? How do you compare Bill Tilden to Rod Laver to Pete Sampras to Roger Federer? They didn't play each other. Well, Roger and Pete did, but that was, you know, Roger wasn't quite as good yet and Pete was going down. So, uh, one of the greatest of all time and uh, perhaps the greatest of all time. At the 2010 Australian Open, Roger Federer lifted his 16th Grand Slam trophy after winning his fourth Australian Open title. In 2011, he went without a Grand Slam title for the first time in nine years. After falling to Djokovic in the semifinals of both the Australian Open and the US Open and to Nadal in the Roland Garros final. I think we actually almost appreciate if that the other person exists and plays so well because it actually brings 
the best uh, out of you. And uh, I've been had a, had, had a harder time when more and more rivals were coming up because mm -hmm. I always thought I don't need those guys. I, I'm just happy to dominate and play so well. But it's it's nice having all these group of guys uh, at the top right now, and you know we've played over what 20, 30 times, mm. and many times we've seen the fair play of the other person, and I think we, because of that we really truly respect each other a lot. At the end of the day, I just tried to play tough and fair, and then made a better guy win. In July 2012, the sixth time champion beat Andy Murray in the Wimbledon's men's final emerging victorious after a three and a half hours game. For me, playing against a Brit in the final, it's something that just can never be taken away and I don't take it for granted. So I'm, I'm happy we lived up to the expectations and were able to play a great match. I fought back and then with the rain delays, who knew what was going to happen then? So I thought he put a brave, uh, put in a, a hero heroic effort really. And I hope he is not too disappointed today when he wakes up because he should be actually very proud of his performance. At Wimbledon, much of the crowd was filled with well-known faces, many of whom felt they'd witnessed a future winner. He played brilliantly, actually, and yeah, as predicted, really. And Roger Federer? Huh? How do you think Roger, Roger played? Classy, as always, yeah. Look, man. You know, Murray could have done it, couldn't he? Let's face it, in the second set, he had all those break points. He was almost there, so what it tells me is next year he's going to be there. What do you think? Are you the best? Uh, no, I, I, I think... Um, the, the comparing the, the generations and the eras and the amateurs before and the professionals now, it, it is impossible to, to compare anyway in the first place. And our life has started to be dominating by the media who, you know, say, OK, you have to achieve this, you have to break that record and you have to move on. And then, you know, you haven't won this yet, so please do that. And that's not how it works. We, I, I, I didn't come into this game to achieve everything. Federer suffered setbacks during his career due to mostly back and knee injuries. Although he was battling crippling back pain that laid him low in 2014, Federer won his first and only Davis Cup against France, one of the oldest and most prestigious events in sports. You feel great emotions, you're unbelievably happy and relieved. Um, you know, uh, we wanted this clearly very badly, um, especially being up 2-1, uh, you, you know, you inch yourself closer and closer and clearly seeing Stan out there and uh, the rest of the team supporting you, you push extra. So it was, um, it was definitely one of the, the better feelings in my, in my career, no, no doubt about it. By 2016, he was the 17th Grand Slam champion. But he suffered a torn meniscus after losing to Novak Djokovic in the Australian Open semifinals. Shortly after losing in the Wimbledon semifinals in July, he withdrew from the remainder of that tennis season. But he was never one to back down from challenges. Well, number one is a, is a tough place to get to. We saw it with a lot of players that struggled to get there. Um, or to get it back one at one point because you you got to play a lot you got to be successful you got to be healthy and that over a 365 day period so uh, yeah no this is not something I actually aimed for you know when I came back from <coughs> from my surgery so I'm um, I'm unbelievably happy that I'm I'm here now um, I would have regrets if I didn't uh, come here to be quite honest uh, and I'm not there yet but I'm very excited for for tomorrow's game, uh, naturally, you know, that's what I came for, so uh, uh, it's nerve-wracking to some extent, but uh, I, I need these moments if I'm still playing tennis, you know, you don't want it to be be simple and relaxed and easy all the time, you want it to be a little bit, it eats you up a little bit, you know, it's a good feeling. At the 2017 Wimbledon Championship, he came back even stronger, proving once again that he was the reigning king of tennis. On 17th July 2017 in London, Roger Federer won his 19th major title and became Wimbledon champion for the eighth time. You know, I am turning 36 in a month, so which is where most players have already been, re been retired for a long time, so I need to just stay healthy. I think that's for me most important. And you know, the not playing bit is very tricky too, because if you don't play enough, you also can get hurt again when you play matches again. 
Well, if he wasn't already, Roger Federer now surely has to be regarded as the best male tennis player of all time. And the most amazing thing about this achievement here is he's done it looking as fit and fresh as he's ever been. And that's because he's taken lots of rests. Federer also became the second man in the Open era after Bjorn Borg in 1976 to win Wimbledon without losing a set as he won his 317th Grand Slam singles match, surpassing Serena Williams' record. His wife Mirka and both sets of twins were in the stands cheering him. Seeing them overlooking Senna Court down on sort of a this um, set, almost like a movie set, you know, with the trophy standing there, their dad sitting here who, who's just won Wimbledon, the beautiful lawn of Senna Court, the championship has just come to an end, and my kids uh, are there seeing all of it. Honestly, it, it means so much to me, it's hard for me to describe, so when I saw them, I was just like, oh my God, this is like, this is the, it's too good to be true, so I'm just so, so happy. I think I definitely got also lucky, but I took a lot of good decisions along the way last year that put me in this position I am right now. Um, but like what you said, it's a huge, huge bonus still to be playing tennis at this level. My God, it's uh, totally unexpected. And there, there's much more tennis coming up this year than last year. At the 2018 Australian Open, he gave an emotional speech and started tearing up while accepting his 20th Grand Slam title. He then received a standing ovation as tears streamed down his face. Wouldn't be the same without you guys, thank you. Um, Marin's team as well, you guys work hard, all the best. <laughs> Just tough, man. And, and my team, I love you guys. <laughs> thank you. At the age of 36, he became the oldest champion of the tournament in the era. Nice to see the sun rise over Melbourne and get into the room. So it was a, a long night, but it was a lot of fun and everybody was in such a good mood. It was, uh, it was a special day, you know, a special week really, a couple of weeks. And then it finished off with a, in, a, in a great way. Hope to be back next year, of course, you know. Um, you know uh, I love playing here, I never missed it, so ever since 98 the juniors and then the qualifying 99, so um, yeah, the goal is absolutely um, to be playing, that's why I took the six months off to, to hopefully be still be playing for a couple of years. Winning more majors than any man, he hoped to keep it up for much longer as the undisputed leader in world tennis. Because of a perfect record, he was compared to tennis legends such as Marcelo Rios, someone Federer had looked up to as a child. Things seem to have come full circle for him. However, more injuries challenged Federer's body capacity and the end of his stellar career. At Wimbledon 2019, Djokovic beat him in the men's final. A moment afterwards too, to say thank you to his fans. Fingers crossed the whole way through, the whole match was so close, yeah, so exciting. It was such a long match, I feel like I've been through five sets <laughs> and more. <laughs> I wanted both of them to win and of course I, I was right, one of them did. By next year, Roger Federer will be almost 39 and so a ninth Wimbledon title may eventually prove beyond him. For Novak Djokovic, he'll already be thinking just how many can he add to his five. Federer underwent three knee surgeries in the space of 18 months the first two in early 2020, and the most recent after Wimbledon 2021, when he lost in the quarterfinals. I also am aware that maybe at 38 I shouldn't be the, the favorite or the overwhelming favorite. It should be somebody else. It should be somebody probably in their 20s. After a break, the 20 Grand Slam champion returned in 2021, but his play was limited. I feel like, I mean, Okay, I'm very tired right now and my legs hurt like mad and my back's stiff now too because I couldn't take any treat. Oh. 
didn't take any treatment plus I was dancing so <laughs> I don't know I feel I feel I guess okay I'm still on the high but all that's gonna like I'm gonna crash eventually but that's okay and I just thought that you know I could probably be dangerous for a top guy maybe beat one and then that would probably be it you know just because the body would start aching which it did uh, or my level would drop which it did and that was a big surprise to me that my level was consistent I am 41 years old. I've played more than 1,500 matches over 24 years. Tennis has treated me more generously than I ever would have dreamt. And now I must recognize when it is time to end my competitive career. Some success brought me confidence and I was on my way to the most amazing journey that has led to this day. So I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart to everyone around the world who has helped make the dreams of a young Swiss ball kid come true. Finally, to the game of tennis, I love you and will never leave you. On September 15, 2022, Federer announced his retirement at 41 years old. How much of a wrench is it to say goodbye? It was hard. It was hard in the first moment. Um, and then I ignored it. I said, I don't want to deal with it. I'm just tired from doing so much rehab. And then once I really had to write my letter to the fans, to the people who have helped me, uh, it, it got really emotional again. After his announcement, the tennis world paid tribute to one of the best to ever pick up a racket. And Wimbledon thanked him for the joy he had brought to so many. Number one fan, along with millions of other people, and I just loved the way his, he played, the creativity he had, the, the quietness on the court, you know, he, he his footwork was so sublime that I always used to say it sort of reminded me of like the concert, the fingers of a concert pianist, you know, just gliding across the keyboard. He's a genius. You know, I think he's, you know, I think obviously his play speaks for itself, but to me, the most important thing that he's been able to do it for so long is his passion for the game. He loves tennis. He loves everything about it. Um, of course, he likes to win and he's an amazing competitor. You don't get to his level without that. But more than any other really great player I've been lucky enough to come across, he just loves the game more, I think, more than, more than anything. He loves to go out there and hit the ball. And I think that's why he said in his, his final comments that, you know, he's still going to be playing tennis. He'll still play exhibitions and get out there with his kids. And so he's just not going to play competitive tennis. He's the most beautiful player. So the fact that he's lasted this long is incredible. He did for tennis was unbelievable. And... You know, he's, he's loved all over the world with the fans and people, and to see him play, it's incredible. Federer made such a physical game look effortless and graceful. With that mental determination, he constantly strived to improve and never failed to show his love for the sport and desire to excel every single time. On September 23, 2022, he played his last retirement match with his longtime rival, Rafael Nadal, at the O2 Arena in London and broke down in tears. Je l'ai vu travailler, je l'ai vu s'entraîner, je l'ai vu jouer, je l'ai vu s'entraîner avec son coach à l'époque, Peter Carter. Et bah, on, on voyait qu'il avait de la graine, qu'il avait de la graine de talent. Euh, qu'il avait une main qui était extraordinaire, qu'il a un caractère qui était vraiment hors norme. Voilà, on voyait déjà qu'il y avait quelque chose, mais que ça allait arriver euh, à ce niveau-là, je ne pouvais pas le prédire, pas du tout, pas du tout. The doubles match at the Lever Cup was his final competitive match. What I heard and the little things that I saw and the, some titles and headlines was very much about me also as a person less only just about forehands and backhands and records and, play, and tennis player which shows that um, people really got to know me over the years on the tour and uh, i've had a wonderful time so this is a, a nice uh, farewell um, tournament for me here in london at the labor cup with all the guys on the team it's going to be wonderful i'm going to really look forward to enjoying it Federer is just the best king the king of tennis <laughs> yeah. the most natural player the most complete player and had to see his last game you know world ambassador yeah. of tennis and uh, knowing he's going to be here and partnering Nadal who's also a legend 
we just couldn't miss it. So we're just so excited for this double so excited. match. Um, well, we feel very lucky to be here for, for such a, a huge event. We're massive Roger fans, massive tennis fans. Um, he's an absolute icon of the sport. And um, if I could sum him up, I would say he's a class act on and off the court. He's won so many times, um, but he's a great person, great personality, real role model for children. And yeah, we just, we just love him. So very lucky to be here tonight. This was a vision tennis will miss. Roger Federer on a court for a final time. Afterwards, Federer bid farewell, hanging up his racket and retiring as one of the greatest tennis players in history. When his love of tennis started, Federer was a ball boy in his hometown of Basel, who used to watch the players with a sense of wonder. Now, he has become an inspiration for countless children who dream of making it big one day. His legacy is long lasting. With extraordinary talent, dedication, passion, and purpose, grace and humility with a great mental approach to tennis and life roger federer created history by climbing his way to the top and capturing the hearts of millions of sports fans all around the world as roger federer's outstanding career came to an end we say goodbye to a champion a genius a legend not just the greatest player or greatest shot maker. Perhaps the greatest sportsman of all time. At the end, I guess I believed I could do it because of the people around me. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy I, I listened to them. Thank you so much. It was lovely to speak to you. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>